Parcells, where the precision is about precise. Um, people like models of things are in a way that they are really going to be talking about. Um, the precision comes in all sorts of like Thanks for coming to today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, today's talk is by Jim Davenport. He's a PhD at Western Washington University in astronomy. What are you studying now? Flares? Mostly flares. Jim studies. Yeah, there you go. I'll show you a picture of one of the stars. That's no, the sun. Anyway, <laughs> he studies stars that show activity where they get really, really bright over a very short amount of time, and he needs to be able to visualize that with Python and like it's a sensible language like Python instead of IDL or garbage. Um, I've known him for quite a while. We went to the same PhD program together. He actually left with a degree. Well, two. I left with just one. Um, so there's that. <laughs> he also runs the site uh, ifweassume.com. And you can find him on Twitter at JRAD. Take it away, Jim. All right, cool. Um, so. I apologize for being slightly low energy as I was telling you, uh, Nick earlier. I have a four week old at home, so not so much on the sleeping. Um, so I'll sort of lean here and keep my mouth moving. Uh, and stop me if I start talking about, you know, food or something. Um, so I'm going to talk about data visualization with Python. 
Uh, mostly I'm going to use this as an excuse to show some pretty pictures, which is really what half the data visualization is. Uh, and then just kind of talk about some key concepts that I think make effective data visualization. Because you're all capable programmers, probably all better programmers than I am. Uh, and you all can go to Stack Overflow and Google and be like, how do I make this color bar? How do I switch red to blue? Like, this is how you actually do the nuts and bolts. Like anything in programming, you Google it. So I'm not going to sit here and guide you through, like, this is how you type in math part. We'll talk about a little of that, and I have some MyPython notebooks, um, or Jupyter notebooks, that I put on GitHub, so I'll, I'll give you a link at the end of the talk, and we can go through that in just a few minutes. Um, as Nick said, uh, I am an astronomer by trade. There we go. Um, so this is, a pic this is a video, actually, of the sun, um, just because as an astronomer I have to show you a picture of something cool in space. Uh, and what I study are flares, which are explosions, small areas of the surface of the star. I study the other stars, but they're so small and far away that you can't see these beautiful pictures. So we use the sun as a, as a visual example. Um, these are short time scale events. Uh, they look like little outbursts. So on the sun, these are small. They occur over a small area. So right, little explosion there. It's pretty cool. It's like all the bombs ever going off in the history of man in like two minutes. Um, I'm interested in this because it creates uh, interesting effects here on the Earth. So this kind of explosion happens in the sun, and a day or two later on the Earth, you end up seeing beautiful things like auroras. This is a painting of a famous huge auroral storm in the 1800s as a result of giant flare in the sun. This is the kind of connection that I care about. Uh, this is the grand, beautiful picture. This is, in a sense, data visualization in an artistic way, right? This is capturing physics capturing how oxygen fluoresces in the atmosphere and blah, 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 uh, and conveying it in a way that is interesting to people. So I can show you this painting. It's on display somewhere. I think it's in Chicago. Um, and we can talk about, well, we can talk about all kinds of physical things, right? How boats sail and mountains of geology. And we can also talk about uh, how the sun impacts life here on Earth and creates these beautiful rural storms, northern lights, things like that. Um, this is sort of the artistic type of, it's like the most artistic kind of data visualization you can imagine. Um, this is what an actual astronomer's day looks like. Uh, it's graphs, right? It's uh, a day, this is, these are pulled from three recent papers that I've been working on. Um, these are just random graphs, dots, colorful points, lines, squigglies, um, captions, right? This is like high school math, like make sure you label your axes. Um, this is what a day in an astronomer's life is like, is making a bunch, or a scientist's life is like, is making a bunch of graphs because how else am I going to tell the story? Right? How am I going to convey to both the public and also to other astronomers? Like, how big was that flare? How often did it occur? And where did it occur? Um, it's going to be a graph, right? This is why graphs and plots and charts, whatever you want to call them, and maps, this is why they are increasingly showing up in newspapers and there are these data-driven websites like 538, which make predictions about elections and sports and Super Bowl and Oscars. Um, this is why charts are becoming more and more common in daily life, because we're able to quantify and convey a complex message uh, into a very small amount of space. Okay, so this is the boring nuts and bolts of what I do on a This is what I do for fun, or at least I did before, yeah, before I got busy. Um, is I run a blog called If We Assume. Uh, and this was sort of an outlet for me to do data visualization, and this is actually how I learned Python, uh, was messing about uh, with just fun open source data. There's a lot of data from like the government, or you can scrape websites, I'm sure you all play around with things like that. Um, and this was an outlet for me to ask data-driven questions that had nothing to do with astronomy. So here's an example um, of a post that I put up a couple years ago. Uh, called We've Always Been at War. Uh, and the story goes, I got on Wikipedia and I scraped every date of a war that Wikipedia had listed. I think there's a couple tables. And I scraped those all, and I put them into Python, and I made some graphs. And there was interesting results. Well, I thought they were interesting. Uh, first off, so this is what we call a histogram. Uh, this is the duration of war, so this is just the end date of the war minus the start date of the war. Uh, and then this is the number of wars each bin. Most wars are very short. This is good. This is why you can use to chug along. Uh, there are a few wars, and they're historically interesting, that are way out here. 
right, note, note how little these points are. There's one or two out here, I think, like sort of 100 year uh, range. So, like, massive, scary conflicts. Uh, thankfully, they're very unusual. And there's things like, you know, like the Korean War, which hasn't ended yet officially. Uh, you know, it's just out here on the other end, but most people would think of it as over. You know, it's, it's kind of an ambiguous number. But most wars are like two years times. If you sort all these by their duration, most fall into that small bin, very few small into this big bin. And you make what we say is like, we call it like a cumulative distribution. So you're sorting it in order of, sorting in order of their duration from the smallest to largest. Uh, then you can see the fraction of wars that are at a given duration. So, right, like 90 to 100% of wars are a year or longer. And, well, 84% of wars, so 84% uh, are shorter than, I think this is 2014, shorter than the war in Afghanistan. So that means the Afghanistan war is already, in 2014, longer than 84% of all wars ever fought, asterisks that Wikipedia has in their database. <laughs> um, right, then it's Wikipedia, so there's a huge bias towards, like, basically it's all the European wars. But um, still, at whatever it was, uh, 13 years at this point, it was one of the longest conflicts uh, ever in the history of man. That's pretty nuts. The other thing that you could measure with such a data set um, it's just a graph over time of the number of wars that are ongoing. And again, this is highly biased towards the data that was uh, put on Wikipedia. Um, but if you just look, so here we are out in 2000 and something, and this is about the duration. There was, a, there was one or two out of here that you just chop off because they weren't interesting looking. Uh, and there's this gap, at least where we didn't have any recorded data. This is the last time... Uh, or the most recent time in recorded history, again, asterisk in Wikipedia, uh, where there was no war. It was 597 AD. The so last year there was no conflict in Wikipedia. And actually there was a war on both sides of that. Uh, but there was like uh, like some king who died, and then the war like took a break, and then the war resumed the next year. So it actually, there was probably, uh, honestly, there probably people fighting at this time. But the point is it's a long, long-ass time ago. Um, so... This is the kind of story, I mean, sorry, this is nothing to do with astronomy, this is nothing to do with like, our daily lives, but it's an interesting conversation piece. Uh, and this is what you get when you take a little bit of data, it's very simple data, right? It's just start and stop times of wars. Uh, and this may not have been that interesting to you, but I was at least able to sit here and talk about it for uh, six minutes, just on start and stop times of wars, and be able to weave a narrative. Uh, and I think this is what data visualization is really about. It's about taking some numbers, and trying to weave it into some sort of visually driven story. So along those lines, let's play a short game uh, called Art or Data. So the game there is, I'm going to show you two images. This is the first set. Uh, I have three sets here. And you guess which one is art, which one is data. It's a little audience participation. So we'll say, who says the left is data? Who says the right is data? Okay, slightly more to the right. Okay, uh, you're correct. Um, yeah, so on the right, we have uh, a bunch of, so four hours of coding. Sorry, the text is a little low here. Four hours of coding where you trace the mouse path using a code called IOGRAPH. So this is somebody coding an eclipse, right? So that's a, that's a, uh, a coding interface. It's a graph. Uh, interactive interface for coding, right? So what you have here is like the file menus up here. Here's like the start line, you know, this is like the left side of the code. Um, I don't know, there's like a run button down here or something, however they have it set up. So you can see, trace out here, where they're spending most of their time. And while this looks like kind of an abstract piece of art itself, if you were designing user interfaces, which like Microsoft and others spend a ton of money doing, you might worry about where these buttons go in relation to each other. If you're spending a lot of time having to go back and forth and back and forth, maybe you could speed up their lives by just a little bit and make their lives a little bit easier uh, by moving that button if they're hitting it over and over and over. So this is like interesting, pretty data. On the left uh, is an art installation uh, about a giant spider web. So it's like a uh, it's like a huge, it's like spider web blown up like a billion times. Um, and so to give a better example of that, here's the creators sitting in it. 
Um, I think it is kind of cool. Uh, I don't know what kind of spider it is, though, because it's kind of a pattern, so it's uh, some kind of spider that I wasn't familiar with. But it's cool. Uh, yeah, here's the... Oh, yeah, I trimmed it. Yeah, so actually, here's the... There's, the, there's like the run button up there or something. Yes. That's great. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, art or data? Neither. So who says the left is art? Who says the right is art? Okay, so you guys are actually, on average, pretty good. Uh, the right is art. Uh, so this is by, I guess he just died recently, Elizabeth Kelly, a famous American painter. Um, it's uh, colored squares. Um, <laughs> on the left uh, is uh, kind of an abstract data visualization, but it took every reference to a color in Alice in Wonderland and then just made it into that color. Right? So you've got white rabbits and red queens and, I don't know, take the blue pill or something. Um, yeah, so it's, it's sort of an artistic data representation, but if you're a fan of Lewis Carroll or of books, they did this for a series of books where they graphed the color frequency inside the book. And it's kind of fun if you care about books. I care about books. Okay, last one. Oh. Okay, so who says the right is data? Who says the right, uh, the left is data? So again, on average, you guys seem to get it. A sharp crowd. Uh, so again, this on the right is another painting. I think this one actually is called like, Colored Blocks or something. It's like Colored Blocks 4 by Ellsworth <laughs> Kelly. He yeah, has a series of views. Actually, they're really pretty, I think. They make really great, like, bathroom tiles. Um, and then on the left is a artistic painted visualization by me, um, which was not intended to look like the thing on the right, but happenstance it does. And I have a little blurb about this visualization um, near the end of the talk, so we'll visit that again. Okay, so the theme that I'm trying to weave here is storytelling. So like storytelling, visual storytelling, through making pictures out of data. The most famous example of this, well, arguably the most famous example of this, you know, modern times, um, is this graph um, about the Napoleonic uh, march, uh, Napoleon's march to Russia. Um, so you may have seen this graph before. Um, a lot of like design students won't have seen this graph. A lot of like, planning students end up looking at this graph. But it tells this really complicated map woven in with a story. Um, there's this guy, Edward Tufty, I'll talk about him again in a minute, uh, who is like uh, one of the messiahs of modern data visualization. And I'm interested in like the philosophy and theory of how you present information graphically. Go pick up some of his books that are really interesting. Go follow him on Twitter. He actually did kind of a nut job. Uh, but his books are really cool. Maybe I can apply it myself, too. Um, okay, so here's how this works. Uh, so this is both a map uh, from, it's too small, I can't read it, but it's from wherever the point left to Moscow, or near Moscow, if I make it, I guess, and then back. The width of the line represents the size of this army. <laughs> okay? So, uh, and then there's a couple of features here, uh, geographically. Like here's a stream, here's a stream, uh, there's another stream here. Uh, I guess these people who like deserted and then came back were like, oh, what, what were you guys doing? It's the back one. Huh? What's the trip back one? Trip back. Trip back. So this is a trip out. This is hitting Russia in the middle of winter when the Russians are sitting inside drinking vodka and eating potatoes and laughing at the French. And the French, you know, turned around. So you can look at this. What makes this incredibly effective is just how devastating this march was, right? They went from this giant thick line to this really skinny line. Um, and I think it's a linear uh, relationship. So he went from like 400,000 to like 40,000 or 30,000, right? He lost like 90% of his troops in this march. Because, and then down here, um, he has charted the temperature. Uh, and on the way back, you can see the temperature dropping on the way back and his troops just going, and they cross this river and they lose like 5,000 people. It's like devastating uh, because French people can't deal with coal. <laughs> I think it's the answer there. So, um, yeah, don't, don't march on Moscow, I think it's the answer. So, this is an old graph, you can see it's written in French, uh, by this guy named Menard, Charles Menard, I think. 
Uh, and he turns out to have actually invented most of the modern basic data visualization. He, he was the first guy to make time series graphs like we see in the stock market. Um, he's one of the first people to make uh, like sort of Cartesian XY plots that we would normally look at. So that shows you in the beginning. Um, and he made interesting sort of uh, overloaded maps like this where things move and things grow and decay. Um, this is a really amazing, effective data visualization. For the medium, it was designed in. Um, this was designed to be printed like three feet across, like a poster, and looked at or put in a book, maybe with slightly bigger fonts. Um, you can see there's all these words and this like scripty font at the top, like you can't read this on a projector. Right? This is not designed for the medium in which I'm displaying it. So while this has this like cult following of a really awesome graph, uh, it actually sucks to put it in PowerPoint because you can't read anything. I have to explain it all. It doesn't. It's not self-evident, right? And this is not good for a PowerPoint discussion, for example, because I want to spend a minute on a slide to convince you of a point and move on. Instead, it took me five minutes to get through this plot, and it's interesting and it has a story. And maybe that's the point you want if you have a website and you want to be right. If this has like JavaScript behind it, you can highlight like, you know, so, oh, this is the river and it died. You know, like that'd be interesting. Um, so part of an effective story is understanding the medium, right? You don't make something that looks great on a poster and stick it this big on a website. Right? So you have to understand your medium. I guess if you did this, you'd use the Google Maps API and you'd have like, some JavaScript things that pop up. And, and you, could, you could imagine recreating this, making an interactive thing, making it some sort of like web-enabled thing. That'd be very cool. Uh, that'd be pretty effective. Okay, so uh, Edward Tufte... Yeah, sort of a, a side note. Uh, this is my graph of how good his books are <laughs> versus the date they were published. So his first book, uh, there you go. The Visual Display of Quantitative Information is like the Bible. It's awesome. If you can find the first edition, it's all in black and white, and you don't you never find yourself really wishing, like, oh, I wish that had, like, red. Um, like, he's just a master of making simple graphs and explaining why maps work here, why... That subway map is awesome. Like, he really breaks down the visual display. Of this is like a standard textbook. Uh, it's very readable. Very, the second edition is good, too. Uh, if you want a little black and red and blue. Um, mixed in together. But yeah, the subsequent books are good, but, you know, less good. But in the end, this is a picture of a dog jumping in water. And I don't know what that has to do with crafts. But um, it's still an okay book. Okay, so storytelling with data. Um, I like this quote from Al Gore. The thing I spent more time on is trying to identify the things that serve as obstacles to people understanding what you're talking about. Um, to paraphrase. Because I think that's what really bites people in the rear when it comes to effective visualization of data. It's the same thing with effective storytelling. Uh, it's probably the same thing that's wrong with this talk. Is <laughs> when you have things that are all mixed up, it becomes hard to convey an overarching story, an overarching narrative. Similarly, if you make something that's so complicated that I have to spend 20 minutes teasing apart, what is this axis, what is this, what does the size of the points mean, you know, whatever. What does the color of the line mean relative to the size of the point? Then I'm not thinking about your story. Um, instead, if you can remove all the extra crap uh, that people look like Excel would stick in your three-dimensional pie chart data visualization, if you can remove all that garbage and whittle it down, uh, Edward Tufty calls it chart junk, um, you remove that junk and you're just left with the trend, then you can tell a really effective story. So here's Al Gore's story, besides being unemployed. Um, <laughs> Al Gore has this great movie, I mean, uh, politics aside, it's, a great, it's like one of the best and most effective PowerPoint slides decks about all time. And he goes around the world telling the story about uh, climate change, right? So if you've seen this movie, uh, Al Gore has this plot, and he's like, uh, there's carbon dioxide, and it goes up and down, right? Carbon dioxide up and down. This is, these are seasons or whatever, yada, 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 he's talking. And he says, and, you know, it's going up a little bit, it's going up a little bit. This is historical data, thousands of data. That's interesting. Um, and he has some basic axes here. So that should show pretty good, that's fine. Whatever, he says, okay, here's temperature, and it kind of tracks with carbon dioxide, blah, 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 blah. And he's telling the story. And there's this moment in the movie, and I guess in the talk, when he, like, he walks to the side, so he's, he's quoting from here. And he's talking about up and down, and, you know, this is like normal, this is normal seasons, this is like slight warming, this is like going out of the ice age, this is fine. And he walks over the side of the stage, 
And he gets in a, a scissor lift, like you would use to change a light bulb in a gymnasium. And then he has this giant projector, projector, you know, it's like a huge movie theater screen. And he shows this line going like this. And then the scissor lift goes up as the line goes up. And it's like this incredibly effective moment where he's like, oh my god, look, there's a problem. This is the inconvenient truth. Uh, TM. Um, <laughs> so, again, whatever your politics are about climate change or science uh, aside, this is a really effective visualization. You look at this, you're like, this is normal. Oh my god, this is abnormal. This is worth renting a scissor lift for just for that point. <laughs> I wondered if he, if he brought his own scissor lift around. He said he gave the talk like five times. Um, so this visualization is worth at least a thousand words. He would argue it's $1.2 trillion of annual damage to the world. Um, in fact, he calls this the hockey stick diagram and goes off the charts. Um, so my message is uh, spend a little time on art, make an effective point. Okay, pivoting now to actual nuts and bolts of how we do this. Uh, I don't know what Al Gore made his charts in, but I use Matplotlib, which is the main workhorse for data visualization in Python. And it's old, and it's awful. It's just god awful. <laughs> and the documentation's all over the place, and it's terrible. But it's what we have, and it actually is way better than it's like democracy, it's like the worst thing you can imagine except for everything else. Um, so Matplotlib is kind of like that. Like there are some better visualizations, like D3 is a great web-based visualization. Oh, that's even more of a nightmare. It is, yeah. Um, but it's at least a newer nightmare. So it's got that going for it. So Matplotlib is, is really effective at doing a lot of things. A lot of things used to be hard in older visualization languages. So Matplotlib is really flexible. It makes some things very easy, and by easy I mean you can Again, you can go on Stack Overflow and be like, how do I do this? Because you can never read the documentation done. So things like, like transparency, you know, this is like this used to be difficult, it's not that difficult, but it used to be too difficult in some languages. In Matplotlib, you just say alpha equals 0.5 and you get 50% transparency. Like there's simple things that you need to make effective drafts that Matplotlib just handles. Uh, color bars, you don't have to figure out how to make them, where to put them, they just pop up if you ask for them. Uh, and there's a huge gallery, and this is, I mean, this is the advertisement. You could, like, tune out, press the talk, or just leave. This is the advertisement. Go to matplotlib.org, uh, I don't know what to do that. Google, Google matplotlib, <laughs> find the URL, and then go to their gallery. And then find the graph that looks most similar to what you want, and there you go. This is, like, the power of documentation, right? <clears throat> documentation isn't just what are the API calls, what is the keywords and the arguments and the default settings. It's like... These are real examples. This is not hello world. These are real work examples of how to make a ton of different awesome graphs. So again, yeah, it's easy where easy is. If you can read their code, you can go through it. You can make their plot. All right? That code, I ran on my computer, and it indeed made exactly the plot that they claimed to have made, which is great. So work examples are your best. OK, so the philosophical points I want to cover so, okay, we're going to use Matplotlib, fine. The philosophical points I want to cover in the last little bit of this talk here um, are just discussion points about design, very basic points about design. Okay, the first point goes back to this chart junk idea, and it also is important for understanding your medium. You want to keep things clean. So these are two default graphs for a time series from Excel. Um, these are, this is a star where it has a periodic oscillation, there's these little flares. So this is my research coming back in. Um, these are, you just take that time series, you stick it in Excel, you say, make a graph. And Excel says, I can make a graph. And it's super easy. So the very range is really low, and that's great. But unfortunately, you can't read this at all. Right? Like you can't, um, I guess if you really, if you're standing as close as I am, you can read this. That's good. Um, this is OK. This is pointless. Like, why is this 3D? Um, this has no need to be 3D. This is like a terrible example, but you can just click on a button and the graph pops up. Um, this is this is terrible. This is the same data remade uh, on one side. It's made in Python. On the other side, it's made in Excel again. Um, so I'm not going to tool shame. If you want to use Excel, use Excel. Just turn off the 3D thing. Make the background black on white. Make it simple. Make it pop. And you can argue about whether or not this is a good visualization, or if you understand it, or who cares. But the point is, it's, it's quantifiably better than the 
previous one. And in one way, is you're avoiding gimmicks. Right? Like, I mean, this, this could easily just be a regular pie chart, um, and it's probably going to be a lot more readable. Um, if you actually needed to make a measurement, say you, like, you know, worked for the, the government, you had to allocate funding to something, and I was trying to make the point that, like, God, you know, like, these people are getting, whatever, fonts are getting way underfunded um, as compared to tutorials or whatever. Like, it's a, it's a complete travesty. Uh, you, that would not be very effectively made. Um, if I ask you, like, how much more, right, this is in the quantified part of it, how much more of this is there of that? You'd be like, I don't know. About this much? Yeah, like, I don't know, like a small, like a small slice of pie. You know, like the slice that you asked for, um, but you actually end up getting half the pie. Um, so you avoid gimmicks. So there's ways around this, right? So then people started putting like numbers in the pie slices to get around this. It's like just adding crap to make up for the fact that it's 3D. But then like they, you know, like, this is this is gimmicky unless it serves your point. Unless this is like everybody else and this is the thing you care about, right? There, there's time and place for these gimmicks, um, especially if you're trying to sell something. Um, but in general, if you're trying to very clearly, like I don't know what is going on here. Uh, this is like a Legos or something. <laughs> 3D is dangerous. 3D is dangerous. And the reason 3D is dangerous is going back to your medium. You don't have 3D paper. Unless you do, and then I want some. Um, but I don't have a 3D computer. I have a 2D screen, and I have to make a chart in 2D. So all these gimmicks, colorizing and popping things out, you could animate it, make it rotate, or you could put it in the web and make it clickable and whatever, and scrollable. These are all tricks to try to get around the fact that you have two dimensional paper or screen. Um, they're important tricks because the world does not exist in two-dimensional data, right? Data that we care about is many-dimensional, right? Lots of things correlate with lots of other things. So you don't always have two-dimensional scatter plots you can make. Sometimes you need to think about five dimensions of things to understand how a market is moving and how this stock is trending with these other stocks. Like that's a multi-dimensional complicated data set. You're not going to have just a simple graph. But this is not better. If, this, if these Lego blocks here were like how one stock compares to another, you'd be like, I don't know, like, what am I doing? Like, how do I make money off of this graph? So gimmicks are dangerous. Even if they look cool, they may not tell your story. Along these lines, everything you do has to have meaning. This is like my big point. Everything has to be intentional. You don't put paint on canvas unless there's a point to it, right? Here's my vocabulary lesson for this end, semiotics, the study of signs and symbols in communication, which basically boils down to things mean things. Like, you have to get them to mean what you're saying, what you're doing. For example, here's a very simple graph. Uh, height versus time. Let's say this is of a person. Um, so if this is the graph, time being birth and death, okay, that's an that's a understandable axis. Uh, height being short to tall, maybe this is a feet or something. Um, we can tell a story about growth spurts and how, you know, you plateau, maybe it dips down a little bit, people shrink at the end of their life for some reason. Um, there's a whole story you can tell here. Uh, and it, it makes sense. It has meaning. Height goes down to up, right? Height goes this way. If you inverted this axis, the data would be the same. It wouldn't make any sense. It's been all day, like, thinking, well, what does this mean? Or you can flip it around. So this is a completely uh, valid... Uh, this is the exact same data, but you just flip the axes. I don't know what the story is now. Like, tall people die. <laughs> like, if you're tall, you're very likely to die. That's the story that I get out of this. Because, you know, in, in the Western world, we, we, we read top down, left right. This is the understanding. Mean, I'm assuming everybody here um, reads that way in the general sense. That is an assumption. Um, but in, in the Western assumption of reading, we read left to right. So time left to right kind of makes sense. It sort of feels more natural. Um, there are times when you might put time on the y-axis if you have things that are moving left to right. You want to see how they change left, in left, left to right space over time. You can imagine like, like, a, like a waterfall kind of visual. But in this case, it doesn't make any sense. right? People progress from short to tall, and then they die. And plus, that's your story. Okay, going along the lines of uh, having intentionality is make things comparable. Well, I think the left graph has a lot of gimmicks that I don't like. 
it's a lot easier to tease apart these fractions than it is on the right. Um, so things like stack histograms can be very difficult um, if you're trying to compare, like, does the gray go up or down with time? The brown seems to go up, but I don't know about the gray. Like, this is confusing. These are, these are things you want to make things directly comparable. And along the same lines, be consistent. So you'll think about this when you do like web design. You, you know, you keep your fonts the same, keep your colors the same. If all your graphs go left to right in your presentation, and then you switch one to make it up down, people are going to be like, "Oh God, wait, what? What is left to right, big, small? Like you, the theme, the style, you must be consistent." So think about your style, and then just pick a style and be consistent. Okay, here's for one more diversion or story time. Um, so there was a data set that the Tate Modern, which is a museum in London, put out uh, a few years ago. They put it on GitHub. And they had this great data set. Uh, this is the file. Is it artists.csv? Yeah, whatever. There's a file here that contains uh, metadata on every single piece of art in Tate Modern Gallery and Holdings Collection. So 60,000 pieces of art that Tate Modern owns. Um, and they put it in this data set. And I thought, that's pretty cool. Like, art is neat. So I was interested in the size of the art, because one of the columns they had was the width, and one of the columns the height. And so I set about making this plot of like exploring the height versus the width. I wanted to know if were there more tall paintings or wide paintings. That's kind of what I was interested in. So I spent a lot of time breaking this data down. I made this really complicated graph uh, where the pixel color is the density of points, and this was the width, and this is the ratio of the height to the width, and there's a logarithmic axis going on here. Um, I mean, the one, you know, I tried to label it like these are, this is 4x3 uh, art, this is 3x4 art, this is 1x2, this is 2x1, uh, this is the golden ratio. I thought this was kind of cool. I put this up in my blog, and people were like, bad. <laughs> like, they were like, that's stupid, I don't care about that. Um, and I was, like, really shocked. I, I was really excited about this. Like, this is really cool. There's these weird, like, uh, blobs in this space where you think about, like, oh, uh, stuff that's 100 centimeters wide uh, tends to be made in these sizes. This is like talking about canvas sizes or something. I thought this was kind of cool. Um, people didn't care about this. There's slightly more tall art than wide art, if you care. I went back and remade this exact same data visualization. Or I took the same data, and I made a new visualization. And people loved it. I hated it, but people loved it. And I thought that was funny. And here it is. And I probably don't have to really explain it to you, where I just drew a box for every piece of art based on its height and its width. And actually, at this, I, this is clipped at like 10 by 10 feet, so this is almost life size. A little bit bigger projector, you have this one life size. Um, and so, right away, you can see trend. You can see clumps in this space. There's a ton of art down here at the small size. There's these groups of lines that clump together, right? So, this is like standard portraits or whatever. Um, there's a few weird pieces. There's, there's one piece here that's, you can't probably can't see it because the projector is, there's like, it's like this tall by this wide. I don't know that. It's like a broom handle or something. I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's art. It's a modern art gallery, okay? So you have, there's like sculpture. There's like weird things going on in here. But there must be some balance of complexity and like just objective artistic beauty. Like, Nobody cared about this plot. I got super excited as a scientist. I was like, look at this trends and the structure and those clumps. Nobody cared about it, basically. This, the Tate Modern reached out and was like, oh, we love this. We'd like to like, re-share re this. And I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. Like, this struck a chord where like, art became data. I thought that was cool. But then the data went back and became art again. That's a cheesy art becomes data becomes art. But this is what you're, you're kind of working on. Well, so it depends on your audience, too. It depends on your audience, right? Like, probably, you know, Nick and I in grad school would have sat around being like, that's cool, what are these clumps? I wonder if we can figure out why there's tall pieces here but not really skinny white, you know? Maybe we would have discussed this. But that's a pretty limited discussion. This got, like, retweeted a bunch. It's really easy. You get the, you get the message. I can get the message across. It's cool. There's metadata. You know, whatever. There is an audience here. If you really cared about the hard numbers behind the visual, you would want the left thing. If you want to, I like, just engage users. The right thing is, I guess, prettier. So, yeah, so it depends on your audience. 
there's challenges in terms of complexity and beauty. There's lots of challenges. So here's, here's a pivot. So when you're giving a talk, or when you're presenting data or telling a story, you're at war with a bunch of things. Uh, you're at war with yourself, your own nervousness, right? your attitude, what you're doing. That's sort of like a self-help thing. Um, you're at war with the data. There are limitations. You cannot make, I can't make the stock market go up, or else I wouldn't be here. I'd be in Hawaii all the time. Um, you can't make 